Today we have a hand where one of my favorite poker video bloggers, Jamin Burton, finds himself in a terribly bad spot with the Jack-10 of hearts against a maniac. Let's see how he handles it. I wanted a calm, relaxing game. No smoke. And I was getting anything but. In this hand, the pass a player from earlier limps. The player to my right, that I've now figured out is all over the place with his sizing and his hand selection, also limps. I look down at Jack-10 suited and raised to $30. The original limper folds, but the second limper, which is the guy on my right, he three bets to $150. Oh boy. Tight passive player limps. Guy who's all over the place limps. We raise the 30 bucks with Jack-10 of hearts. Let's stop right there. If you think that there is any decent likelihood that you're going to get limp re-raise playing 300 big blinds deep at 2-5 no limit hold'em where perhaps you make it 30, they make it 150, you'd probably rather just limp behind. I know that may sound really nitty, really cautious, but just because people limp does not mean you have to raise them if their limping ranges are going to be very tricky. Now, in this scenario, I think raising is perfectly fine and standard, but I think a lot of people get it in their minds that limping behind is absolutely terrible. But that's definitely not true, especially when they do not take a rake out of every pot. Now, I don't know what I don't know exactly what they do at the Encore 2-5 game, but a lot of games 2-5 and higher, they will take a time rake where every 30 minutes everybody pays the dealer five or ten dollars or something like that. In which case there is effectively no rake in each individual hand. So in games like that, it's definitely fine to limp with a decently wide range. Don't think you must raise limpers every single time. Although in this scenario with Jack Ten Hearts, I think limping is perfectly fine. All right, initial limper folds with who knows what. And then the initial, well, the second limper, who we have as all over the place, limp re-raises. This is a scenario where you always want to ask yourself, what does this opponent's range look like? And are they actually maniacal? Now, from uh, watching this entire video, I already know what happens. This player, uh, Jamin kind of has pegged as a bit of a maniac. So, look, I realize maniacs can be very difficult to play against, so I want to know what you all think the proper adjustment against a Maniac is. Should you just play tight and wait for the nuts? Should you call wider and try to get involved in a lot of pots with a Maniac? Or should you try to fight fire with fire and re-raise them and try to beat them at their own game? Take a second, pause the video, and write what you think the optimal adjustments are in the comment section below. Well, that was a trick question. The answer is all of them to some extent depending on the type of maniac you're get against. If your maniac is just absolutely absurd and is going to be ripping their money in over and over and over again, you probably just want to tighten up a little bit and wait for decently strong hands you don't have to fold. If your maniac is going to be involved in a lot of pots and just blasting at post-flop with all sorts of junk, essentially, you want to call in position with hands that flop decently well, like suited connectors, suited aces, pairs, maybe even just regular connectors like the the 9-8 offsuit, etc., and try to make really good hands that just don't have to fold. And then, if your maniac is a little bit more thoughtful, a little bit more intelligent, and they are going to presume that if you are willing to re-raise the maniac, that you must have a very strong hand, well, against those maniacs, you definitely want to fight fire with fire. So, playing against a maniac is not just as easy as do this one thing and you'll crush them. You have to figure out specifically what your opponent does incorrectly and then adjust accordingly. So, in this spot... If we're 1,500 deep, I think calling is the only play that makes sense. But in this scenario, the opponent actually has about $700 behind, give or take. In that spot, I think it gets a little bit more tricky because now you're not getting such good pot odds. Let's take a listen to see what happens. A bit unorthodox, but it's possible he could be purely playing back at me. To be honest, I had been really active this session. I eye a stack and see that he has about $700 behind this is a close one. I have a decent hand in position, but we aren't very deep when there'll be $300 in pre. I decide he's just too all over the place for me to find the fold here and make the call. All right, what should we do if we know the opponent's limp raising range is far more than only aces and kings and queens? Well, perhaps we should fight the fire with the fire. Now, I realize Jack-10 of hearts is not a great hand if you get it all in and get called, but I actually don't hate just ripping it all in here. If Jamin's read is that Jamin's been active, this player is 
maybe just trying to push around the guy who's obviously trying to push around the limpers, and they're going to limp re-raise with all sorts of stuff, then we should probably just put them all in. Because unless they have a very strong hand, they're going to have to fold. And if they do call it off with a hand like nines or eights or sevens or ace-queen, it's not really the end of the world. And if they do ever fold out, we just win the $150 re-raise they put in, plus we get our 30 back, and the, the blinds and the antis, if there is an ante. I don't think there's an ante here, but you get the blinds and the initial limper. So if you think you have a decent amount of fold equity, and I think we may actually have a decent amount of fold equity here, I don't mind ripping it in. Now, that's going to result in lots of variance and lots of swings. And I know a lot of cash game players hate the idea that they may get stacked, especially with a junky hand like the Jack-10 of hearts. But if your opponent's range doesn't contain aces and kings and queens and jacks and tens and ace-king and ace-queen and ace-jack and king-queen and those types of hands, because remember, they limp behind a very clearly passive limper, that makes their range incredibly capped to the point that they're not just going to call off all their money unless they have, you know, one of the very weird slow played hands or perhaps, you know, nines or eights or ace queen. And even then it's fine, right? So this may be one of these interesting scenarios where I think we get to win the pot very often by ripping it in. And even when we don't, I think we're in a pretty good equity. Now, if you think they're going to be trapping with aces, that all changes. But a lot of players aren't going to be limping behind a weak, passive person with aces, hoping somebody attacked raises so they can then re-raise. A lot of people don't do that. Although, if this player really is all over the place, then maybe, maybe they do. In that case, just call and see the flop. The flop comes down pretty beneficial to me in Queen 10-5 with one heart. It. He continues for another $150, and I call. This is a great spot to just call. You definitely do not want to raise. If you raise and get it in, you're going to be very unhappy. By calling, you keep your opponent in with all of their bluffs. And right here, again, if the opponent's all over the place, they could have ace suited. They could have under pairs. They could have a worse 10. They could have, you know, king, king four of clubs for all I know, right? You really, really, really want to keep them in. The turn brings a second queen and a second heart, and he shoves for about $550, and I snap. <laughs> we beat him in the pot. Um, I mean, look, on pretty much any turn besides an ace or a king, I think we have to call it off. If a king comes and he rips it all in, we're getting two to one pot odds to call, so we need to win 33%. This is one of these scenarios where you have to realize you're not just purely drawing, because sometimes you're good whenever a random king comes, because he may rip it in with ace X, especially if he has a flush draw. And we, we beat the ace X, right? So in this spot, if we think we're just purely drawing to improve to trips or a straight, and we have an open-ended straight draw, we're going to win, what, 25-ish percent of the time when we're behind? And when we're ahead, we win 75, 80% of the time. So I think if we get a king, we have to call it off as well, which feels pretty gross. Um, Jack, I mean, Jack's actually kind of a rough card as well because we lose to ace-jack now and ace-king, although I don't think he has ace-king all that often. But I think we still probably have to just call it off with a jack because he could have random ace X suited and king X suited, right? And I think if it comes a nine, we have to call it off too because we have open-ended again, right? Any lower card, we got to call it off as well. So this is a spot where <laughs> when we call the flop, we're playing for all the money most of the time. The river jack improves my two pair, but it matters little when he turns over pocket nines. <sighs> pocket nines, interesting spot, right? This is one of these scenarios where if we did rip it in preflop and he calls, we get it in flipping, which is fine. Obviously, the way Jamin played it worked out way better because we got it all in with, I don't even know how much equity, 95% equity for all the money, which is clearly very good. But I think this is a spot where if this type of hand is one of the best hands the opponents can have, then we just end up winning the pot very, very frequently before the flop with no contest. And when we do get called, unless you think they're tricky with the aces, I think we... Uh, I think we're gonna be in pretty good shape whenever we even when we do get called so very cool hand it's nice whenever you're going to just go to the poker table for a nice chill game and then you get re-raised every single hand sometimes that's how it goes make sure you come prepared to battle and make sure you figure out how your particular maniac plays that's gonna be it for today if you enjoyed this video do me a favor click the like and subscribe button below also click the notification bell it's that way i think you'll find it also make sure you check out jamin's video blog We'll put a link in the description below. He does amazing work there. It's a lot of fun, very unique, and he takes poker video blogs to the next level. Congrats to him on that. Good luck in your games. Have fun, and I'll talk to you next time.